Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 16 of Introductory Linear Algebra. Today we're going to answer the question of what happens if you apply two or more linear transformations one after another, okay? So you start off with some vectors in n-dimensional space and you apply a linear transformation to it and then you apply another linear transformation to it. What happens? What is sort of the total net effect of applying those multiple linear transformations in sequence like this? Okay, so let's start off just sort of by drawing a schematic picture here. Okay, so the setup is you've got just like I'm thinking of this box as that box is all of Rn. It's n-dimensional space and in that space somewhere is some particular vector v that I care about. Okay, and now I'm going to apply some linear transformation to that space. So what's going to happen is this linear transformation t, it's going to turn Rn into Rm. Okay, it turns n-dimensional space into m-dimensional space and it turns the vector v, of course, just into t of v, whatever that is. Okay, well, I could apply another linear transformation to this space over here now. And if I do that, okay, now I'm applying some linear transformation s and that turns m-dimensional space into p-dimensional space. Okay, and of course it turns t of v into s of t of v, whatever that is. Okay, so this is a fine and dandy thing to do, and it's something that we do very often, <clears throat> but what we're going to do now is we're going to sort of combine those two linear transformations into one. We're going to give a name to the linear transformation that goes all the way from the starting space to this ending space, skipping over the middleman, okay? And that linear transformation, we're going to call it S composed with T. That little circle in the middle there, that means composed, and that just means do one after the other. So S of T of V, well, that's the same thing as S composed with T of V. Okay, and maybe you've seen this notation and this idea earlier in functions courses or calculus courses as well. It is the same idea as just composing functions of single variables before, if you've seen that idea. All right, and the remarkable thing that happens is when you do this with linear transformations, well, you can figure out what the standard matrix of the composed function is from the standard matrices of the individual ones very easily, okay? And the way it works is all you have to do is you multiply the standard matrices of the individual linear transformations together, okay? And that's the content of this theorem that we're going to go through now, okay? So here's the theorem. It says that if we've got two linear transformations and we compose them together, okay, so we construct S composed with T, then two things happen, okay? And the first thing that happens is this composed function here is a linear transformation, okay? The fact that the composition of these two functions was, our, was a function that was obvious from the definition, okay? Com composition of two functions is always a function. But what was not obvious was that it would be a linear transformation, okay? So that's the first part of this theorem. If you compose two linear things, you get something that is still linear, okay? And then the second part of this theorem says that the way you can compute the standard matrix of the composition of those two linear transformations is just by multiplying the individual standard matrices together. Okay, and this is really remarkable, and actually this is why matrix multiplication was defined in the weird way that it was. We wanted this theorem to be true, okay? We want multiplication of two matrices to correspond to doing two linear transformations one after another, right? Here we've got do the linear transformation T, and then do the linear transformation S, and then on the right, we've got matrix multiplication, and we want those two things to be the same. That's why, way back in the day, people defined matrix multiplication the way they did, right? I mean, remember, it's, it's just this weird, ugly formula with dot products in the entries of, of every entry of this product. Like, why would anyone ever come up with that formula? Well, this is why. They wanted this theorem to be true. Okay, so let's actually go through the proof of this theorem, okay? And and actually, it's extremely straightforward. It's a one-line proof, um, just because everything has de been defined sort of in the right way to make this work out nicely. All right, so how do we prove this? Well, let's just compute S composed with T of V, okay? And by definition, S composed with T, what does that mean? It means you do T first, and then you do S first, okay? So you apply those two linear transformations one after another. And now I'm just gonna start representing things by matrices, okay? T of V, remember, like I can represent things via matrices, and this is gonna be the same as the standard matrix of T times the column vector V. Okay, so that's all I've done in the middle here. I replaced the linear transformation by the matrix. Okay, and now we can do the same thing with S. S is a linear transformation and I'm applying it to some vector. Well, that's the same as the standard matrix of S multiplied by the column vector T times V. All right, so then I just use my standard matrix result again, okay? 
And now I'm just gonna add some parentheses to sort of highlight something here. I'm gonna think of this not as s times t times v. I'm gonna think of it as s times t, and that's just one unit, and then that's times v. Okay, so what I've got here is I've got some matrix times the column vector v, and that equals s composed with t applied to v. Okay, but if you go back up to our theorem about standard matrices, that theorem said, yes, every linear transformation has a standard matrix, but also standard matrices are unique. In other words, every linear transformation has only one standard matrix. Okay, so there's only one matrix with the property that linear transformation applied to V equals matrix times V. Okay, and that's exactly what we've got here. We've got linear transformation applied to V equals matrix times V. So whatever matrix this is has to be the standard matrix of S composed with T. Okay, so we're done just by uniqueness. Okay, uniqueness tells us that, yeah, that really is the standard matrix of that linear transformation, right? right? So that's just our concluding sentence that says, okay, well, just pluck out whatever's here, and yeah, that must be equal to the standard matrix. Okay, this is really, really nice for computations, because now, if you ever have sort of a sequential application of linear transformations, you know that the way that you can compute what happens is just via matrix multiplication. Okay, so let's do a couple examples. What vector is obtained if we start off with a vector for two, and then we rotate it counterclockwise around the origin by 45 degrees, and then we go one step further and we project that resulting vector onto the line y equals 2x. Okay, so we do two things to the input vector here. We rotate it and we project it. So we're gonna need two standard matrices. We're gonna need the standard matrix of the rotation and we're gonna need the standard matrix of the projection as well. Okay, so let's start off with the standard matrix of the rotation, just because that's a little bit easier. We have an explicit formula for it from last class. Okay, we learned that rotation matrices, the way you construct them is you throw cosines on the diagonal and then sine and minus sine on the off diagonal. Don't forget to put the negative up in the top right corner and throw the angle inside of each of those trig functions. And then we're just gonna use the fact that cosine of pi over four is one over root two and sine of pi over four is also one over root two. So this is our rotation matrix. If you multiply a vector by that matrix, it rotates it counterclockwise by 45 degrees. To the, the other uh, matrix that we need is the projection onto the line y equals 2x. Okay, and this one's a little bit trickier because our formula for projections onto a line from the previous class, it depended on having a unit vector on that line, not having the formula for that line. So we'll have to do a little bit of a conversion first. Okay, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to compute a unit vector u on this line y equals 2x. Okay, and the way that you can do this is just start off with any vector on that line. In other words, start off with any vector that has y equals 2x. So its y component is double its x component. So I'll just start off with the vector 1, 2. Okay, and then you normalize it, rescale it so that it has length 1, renormalize it so that it's a unit vector. Okay, so take this vector w, divide by its length. So first off, compute its length, which is root 5, and then divide it by its length. So u, our unit vector, is going to be 1 over root 5 times one, two. Okay, so that's a unit vector on that line, y equals two x. Okay, and then our formula from the previous class said, okay, great, now that you've got that unit vector, then the standard matrix of the projection onto that line is just u times u transpose, where you're thinking of u as a column vector. So let's just do that multiplication. Here's u as a column vector times u transpose. Okay, and when you do that multiplication, remember, like it's kind of weird here when you have a column times a row, like you're doing rows dotted with columns. So every one of your dot products has just one entry. It's one times one in the top left, one times two in the top right, two times one in the bottom left, and two times two in the bottom right. So altogether you get a two by two matrix. These one over root fives combine and give you one over five, and then the four numbers you multiply give you the four entries of that two by two standard matrix. Great, now we've got the individual standard matrices. Well, the theorem that we just proved said if you want the standard matrix of the composition, what you do is you multiply the individual standard matrices together. Okay, so standard matrix of PU is that, standard matrix of R pi by four is that, and I just moved all the scalars out in front, right? I had a scalar of one over five that's now out in front, and I had a scalar of one over root two that's also now out in front. And now you just multiply those two matrices together, and this is the matrix that you get when you do your matrix multiplication rule. So what that matrix does is this matrix does both of those geometric things that we talked about. This matrix, it rotates vectors and then projects them onto a line. It does that all in one step. 
Okay, so if we wanna do that operation to this vector four two, all we have to do is we take this matrix and multiply it by the vector four two. All right, so yeah, so the result is that the composition applied to the vector four two is the same thing as this standard matrix times the vector four two, and you just do that matrix multiplication. And what you get is ugly scalar times the vector 1428. Okay, and if you want to simplify that, maybe make it a little bit clearer what's going on here, I'm just going to regroup the scalars out in front. I'm going to pull a, a 14 out of each of the entries in this vector, and I can rewrite that as 7 times root 2 over 5 times the vector 1, 2. Okay, and this makes at least a little bit of, a sen of sense, because the last thing that I did in this geometric description was I projected onto this line y equals 2x. Okay, so the resulting vector that I get at the end of the day had better be on that line. So its y-coordinate had better be double its x-coordinate. Okay, and I can see that that's true here. Its y-coordinate is double its x-coordinate, and that's got a funky scalar out in front that sort of determines how long it is. Alrighty, so let's do another example. Okay, so this time what we're going to do is we're going to find the standard matrix of a linear transformation that first projects onto some line, and then stretches in the x-direction and the y-direction by different amounts, okay? So stretches in the x-direction by a factor of 2 and in the y-direction by a factor of 3. So it's going to do these two different things one after another again. So this is composition of the linear transformations. All right, so how do we do this? Well, we've got to find the standard matrices individually. We're going to need the standard matrix of the projection onto this line, and we're also going to need the standard matrix of this sort of x and y stretch, but we'll talk about that in a second. Let's start off with the standard matrix of the projection onto the line. Okay, again, the way that we can find the standard matrix of the projection onto this line is start off with any vector on that line and then renormalize it to get the vector u that you want. Okay, so any vector on that line, well, I don't know, I'm just going to scale it so that has integer entries. How about the vector 3, 4, right? Because if x is 3, then y is going to be 4 thirds times 3. Oh, it's going to be 4. Okay, so yeah, this vector w is on that line. The y coordinate is 4 thirds times the x coordinate. And then we just rescale that, normalize it so that it has length one, so divide by its length. Its length is gonna be, da, 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 drum roll, it's gonna be five. Okay, so the vector, the unit vector on that line is one fifth times three four. Or you can bring that scalar inside if you like, it's three fifths, four fifths. Okay, and then again, just use the formula that we proved in the previous class. The standard matrix of the projection is u times u transpose. So just plop in what our vector u is as a column vector. Okay, and then u transpose is the row vector. You do that multiplication, the 1 fifth times 1 fifth is going to be 1 over 25 out in front. And then these entries multiplied by these entries give you the 2 by 2 matrix. All right, so that's the standard matrix of the projection. Okay, the standard matrix of the scaling in the x and y directions, remember this is a linear transformation that we called a diagonal linear transformation in the previous class. Okay, remember if you're just doing independent stretches in the coordinate axis directions, that's diagonal, and you just put the stretch factors along the diagonal. If we're stretching in the x direction by a factor of 2, that's my first diagonal entry. If you're stretching in the y direction by a factor of 3, that's my next uh, diagonal entry. And then my off diagonal entries just are zeros everywhere. Okay, and now if I want the standard matrix of t, the composition of these two linear transformations, all I've got to do is multiply, okay? So standard matrix of T, the linear transformation I actually care about, is the standard matrix of the composition of those two component linear transformations, which by my theorem is the product of the individual standard matrices. And then I just plop those in, okay? I pulled the one over 25 all the way out to the front because I can do that with scalars. And then I just have to multiply the individual standard matrices together. And when I do that, I get some ugly junk but the point is, this ugly junk has the net effect of doing both of these geometric things at once. So th this matrix, if you multiply any vector by this matrix, what you're doing is you're projecting it onto that line, and then you're stretching it by different amounts in the x and y directions. Alrighty, as one final example of something that's sort of neat that we can do with these ideas, what we're going to do is we're going to derive the angle sum formulas for sine and cos, okay? So you've already learned these formulas some point at, you know, some previous point in your mathematical education. These are the formulas for things like sine of theta plus phi or cos of theta plus phi, right? And you have these, these trig identities that tell you how you can compute these in terms of sine of phi and cos of theta and things like that. Okay, we're going to rederive. We're going to show you where those come from. Okay, and you can do this via matrix multiplication and standard matrices. So this is kind of neat. 
Okay, and the way that you get at this is you have to realize that you can think about rotating by an angle of theta plus phi in two different ways. You can think of it as, okay, I rotate by theta and then I rotate by phi more, or you can think of it as I rotate by theta plus phi all at once. Okay, so there are two different ways that you can think about rotating by this angle theta plus phi. Okay, and what this tells us is that these two linear transformations must be the same thing. Rotate by theta plus phi all at once, or rotate by, by phi and then rotate by theta more. Those do the same thing to every vector, so they're the same linear transformation. So in particular, because of the same linear transformation, they have the same standard matrices. Okay, but then we can apply our theorem. Standard matrix of this composition is the product of the individual standard matrices. Okay, and this is really good for us because while well, we can compute this directly from a formula and we can compute these two matrices directly from a formula, and then we'll just compare entries. Okay, and we'll know that the entries have to be the same as each other. Okay, starting off just with the matrix on the left, just because it's easier, the standard matrix of the rotation by some angle is always just this. You just throw whatever that angle is inside the cosines on the diagonal and the sines on the off diagonal, and you have this negative in the top right corner. Okay, so that's just by definition, you know, we, we, we justified this last class. This is the formula for, for rotation matrices. Okay, so that's what the left-hand side looks like. And then the right-hand side, what's it look like? Okay, well, standard matrix of a rotation by theta is same formula with theta plugged in. Standard matrix of a rotation by phi is same formula just with phi plugged in. And then all you've got to do is multiply those together. What do you get? Well, you get a formula that's too big and ugly that I have to move, but it's just standard matrix multiplication. Okay, so you get this big matrix over here. Okay, and what we just argued was that this matrix has to be the same as this matrix down here. Okay, so all of their entries have to be the same in particular. Okay, so if you look at the top left entries, what this tells us is cosine of theta plus phi, that must be the same as cos theta cos phi minus sine theta sine phi. Those two things are the same. So that gives you that trig identity, the, the angle sum identity for cosine of a sum. And you can do the same thing for sine of a sum. Sine of theta plus phi is the same thing as sine theta cos phi plus cos theta sine phi. Those are the same. So that gives you the trig identity for sine of a sum of two angles. Okay, and you can look at these uh, entries over on the right as you, well as if you want, but those aren't going to give you anything new. They're just going to give you the same formulas over again. Okay, so you just compare entries and you get those trig formulas. Okay, so you don't need to remember those trig identities anymore as long as you remember how to multiply matrices and the formula for the standard matrix of a rotation. Those two pieces of information together give you these angle sum identities and a whole lot more, of course. Alrighty, so that'll do it for this week. Uh, so we're done with linear transformations for a little bit. We're gonna jump ship and start talking about a new topic next class. We're gonna start talking about systems of linear equations. Okay, so I'll see you then.